I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Luke 19 is our text. If uh, you're with us at either of our campuses and you don't have a Bible, then uh, grab one of the Bibles around you here at Sweetwater. They're in the seats around you at our Parker campus. They're at a table right at the back of the room. Go grab one of those Bibles right now and turn to page 1044, and you'll be able to follow along with us in Luke 19. That's page 1044. And, and as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. It's our gift to you. If you're joining us online, we're delighted to have you. But if you need a Bible, you don't have a Bible to read and you want one, let us know. We'll get a Bible to you because we want everyone to have a Bible so that you can read God's Word. Because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, since I mentioned uh, our Parker campus is joining us, uh, I just got to tell you I'm excited because this week, finally, after just about a year of uh, working on this, the permits are approved and they're waiting to be pulled and the remodel can start sometime soon. So we're cheering here at Sweetwater Parker. I hope you guys are uh, making a lot more noise uh, right there. So uh, I'm excited about that. I can't wait. Uh, Pastor Ruben is excited about that and we are uh, looking forward to seeing what God does and continues to do in Parker. Now, uh, before I, I dive into the message, uh, I just got to mention, you know, we're, we're past Thanksgiving officially. I know it's the weekend, still the holiday weekend. We're past Thanksgiving, and so we're already geared up for Christmas, right? How many of you did some Black Friday shopping? Go ahead and confess. Uh, those hands are up. Okay, well, whether you left your house or not doesn't matter because you can still do it. But, um, but see, you know, Christmas is ahead of us, and that means Christmas Eve services will be, you know, promoting those coming up. But I just want to share this. If you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, and you haven't yet been baptized, we would love to help you be obedient. And, uh, and I can't think of a better time of year than when we're celebrating the birth of our Savior that you testify, you proclaim to the world that the Savior has changed your life. So if you're thinking about getting baptized, you know that's what God wants you to do, let us know. We do, we'll, look, we'll do it any service, anytime. Actually, we'll do it anywhere there's water in a crowd, anytime. We don't, we don't care. We'll just, we just want you to be obedient to Jesus. We want to help you do that. But if you'd like to get baptized on Christmas Eve, let us know. Uh, I love Christmas Eve baptisms because there's a, you know, this, our campuses are filled with people who don't usually come to, to church, and they get to see people declaring their faith in Jesus. And that gets me excited. So I'm just throwing that out there. If that's you, then grab one of those Connect cards right now and fill it out. We'll give you a call. We'll set it up and rejoice in that together. So how many of you uh, like accountability, like for yourself? <laughs> see, I didn't ask that for yourself at the beginning part. We could ask that question differently. See, here at Calvary, we really enjoy accountability. And I say enjoy because I mean it. Now, we've learned to embrace accountability uh, enthusiastically because of mistakes in the past. Like, for instance, we had a, a school administrator back at the very beginning of Calvary Christian Academy that embezzled money and uh, so, you know, got arrested, has a felony record for theft, all that kind of stuff. And so we learned that financially, we trust, but we verify everything. Multiple layers. We do accountability really well when it comes to money. Uh, and, and that applies across the board. And, uh, and we learned, uh, you know, accountability uh, with our kids. Look, if you're going to be a volunteer at Calvary, we're going to ask you to do a background check. You go, well, you can trust me. Yeah, we're going to trust you, but we're going to verify. See, that's, that's how that works. We're going to trust and validate. And not only are we going to ask you to, to you know, all of, all, all of our volunteers get background checked, but if you're working with anyone under the age of 18, we're going to ask you to get trained as well on child safety and all the measures that apply. We have all these rules. Why? Because we're going to trust you, but we're going to make sure that our kids are safe. We care more about our kids than we do about your ego. So uh, that's, that's just how we, we do it. So we, we embrace accountability. And, and I don't know if you've realized this or not, but, uh, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm better with accountability. I'm just a better person with accountability. So uh, it, it's kind of like, when, remember when you were in school, they had these little things that annoyed most of us called tests. Anybody like taking tests? See, oh, a couple of you raised your hand. Now, look, I'll admit, I like taking tests over writing papers, Okay, Any, anyone with me on that? Pa tests over papers? A anyone? Yeah. See, I, I like that because I'm lazy. But, uh, 
I don't want to write the paper if I can just take the test, but, but here's the thing. The only reason I ever studied for a test was the accountability of grades, right? If they'd said, hey, we're not going to grade the test, would I have studied for the test? No. Why would I do that? Why would I waste time doing that? You know, see, the accountability held me uh, captive to saying, I want to pass because of grades, because I didn't want to have to look at my dad and say, hey, I'm failing. You know, the same is true at work. You know, if you know you're going to get a review, if you know you're going to get a bonus, if you know there's, there's some kind of accountability, we tend to do better. Yeah, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I love living in Lake Havasu, and one of the reasons is because of accountability. I know that I represent Christ in Calvary 24-7, and it helps me to be a better pastor, and it helps me to be a better Jesus follower, because I know that everywhere I go in this town, there are people who are watching me. <laughs> Now, that annoys some people, and I just go, no, it's great, because that means I don't get to have bad moments. I don't get to have bad days. I don't get to, uh, to give in to the worst impulses in myself. Accountability makes me better. Now, the truth is, whether you like accountability or not, you cannot escape accountability in this life or the next. So today, we're looking at a parable that Jesus told about accountability, he told it just before Holy Week. Holy Week is when, you know, he's, he's going to enter Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. He, he's going to teach. He's going to preach. He's going to work miracles. And then he's going to be arrested and crucified and rise from the dead. So this is right before that. This is significant in the timing of this and the placement of this because uh, he's about to be handed over to the religious leaders who are supposed to be representing God to the people of Israel and are not doing that uh, because they're going to reject Jesus and they're going to request and even demand his crucifixion. So that's, that's the backdrop of this as Jesus tells the parable of the ten minas. Verse 11, Luke 19, and this is what Luke writes. He says, as they heard these things, Jesus proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Jesus said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. And then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept uh, hid away, laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And the master said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have get collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he already has ten minas. I tell you that everyone who has more, has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Now, pretty harsh parable in, in some ways. But I want you to be, uh, just begin with the story. The story. There's two groups of people in the story. There's servants and there's citizens. And, and, and it begins with a nobleman or a king who's going away. And, ag and again, I'm just going to point this out. Jesus is telling this right before he's going to go away. This is connected to him. This is connected to the kingdom that he is laying the foundation for through his death and resurrection with the apostles. And he says, hey, I'm about to go away. And he says this king gave, entrusted his servants with money. So he called 10 servants to them, gave them each a mina. Now, we don't travel in minas. I don't think any of us has a mina in our pocket or a purse right now. 
But uh, let me explain what Amina is uh, in the time of Jesus. So it's not insignificant. Let's put it that way. Amina equals about three to four months wages for the people of Jesus' day. So an American equivalent means it'd be between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. So he called his servants to him and he said, hey, here's 20 grand and I'm going to go away and I want you to take this and I want you to invest it and when I come back then we'll, we'll settle accounts. That's basically what he did. He had 10 employees. He said, you guys each get 20 grand and let's see what you do with it. It's, you know, sort of like the, the Apprentice or something in, in before that ever became a show. Now, in the story, notice the accountabilities because the accountabilities are all over the story. The first one that we see is the accountability for the servants. See, we see account given by three of the ten servants. Now, the, the story is really implying that all of them were held accountable, but it gives us three examples. And the first one turned 20,000 into 200,000. Not bad, huh? So that's the, and he says, well done. You, you were a good servant. You did a good job. And by the way, because you were faithful with this little bit, I'm going to give you much. And he puts him in charge of 10 cities. Second one that they report turned $20,000 into $100,000. And, and again, the master uh, rewarded him. He said, good job. You're, you're faithful with a little. I'm going to put you in charge of five cities. And then the third one that it gives the, the account of says, hey, I took your $20,000 and I turned it into $20,000. And he was condemned. He suffered loss. It, even what he had was taken away from him. Now, whether you think this is fair or not, really doesn't matter. I mean, if you read this and you're offended somehow because it's not fair and you don't know, you might have questions like, well, what, what were the parameters and was it all explained? This is, none of those things matter. Jesus is explaining the kingdom of God. He's saying this is how the kingdom of God works. And, and by the way, it's the kingdom of God. He's the king. We do not get a vote. Okay? Even with lousy voting machines or anything like that, we don't get a vote. Okay? This is how the kingdom operates. So the first question I need to ask you is, are you a servant of the king? See, there's two groups of people in the story. There's servants and there's citizens. Are you a servant of the king? Which means, have you confessed Jesus as Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus and said, hey, you have authority over me, and I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to do what you want me to do? Are you following Jesus with your life? Now, if the answer is no, that you're not yet a, a servant of the king, then you really want to stay tuned for the rest of the story because the servants are the preferred people in the story. And, and we want you to stay tuned so you can hear the rest of the story, but the truth is we want you to find your life and purpose in Jesus. Because Jesus is the only way you're going to find eternal life. Jesus is the only way you're going to find that ultimate purpose, and we want you to find that. So, uh, if you said yes, you're a servant of the king, then the next critical question is this. Are you being productive for the kingdom of God? Are you being productive for the kingdom of God? Now, I don't know about you, but when you read the parable of the ten minas, and, and there's a, a very similar one in Matthew 25 called the parable of the talents, uh, these are eye-opening kind of parables because they tell us what God's expectations of his servants are. And if we identify ourselves as a servant of Jesus, then we want to hear, we want to know, at least I do, what God expects of us, what Jesus' expectations of you and I are. So the servants that produced were, were rewarded. The servant that was lazy or afraid was condemned. That's accountability. The master went away, he came back, he held his servants accountable. He said, what have you done? You did well, you get a reward. You did poorly, then there's condemnation. So, uh, Another way to put it is, the servants that studied hard passed the test. And the servant that didn't study failed and made excuses. See, the, the master has entrusted you and me with much. What are you doing with it? Now, you may be sitting here thinking, I don't have much. Let me just point out the things that God has given you. He's entrusted to you as his servant. He's given you time. How are you spending it? He's given you time. Now, look, whatever time you've had to this point, 
is grace. And whatever time you have going forward is grace because you don't know how many more days you have. And I don't want to be morbid or anything, but I was part of a funeral service for a 16-year-old girl this morning. And, and that's not a joyful thing to be a part of. But I'm just telling you, what are you doing with the time that God has given you? How are you spending that time? And then God has given you abilities. How are you using those abilities? And don't sit there and think, oh, I don't have any talents. I don't have any abilities. Yes, you do. Every one of us has, is able to serve God. And not only are you naturally talented in some way that God created you, but as a follower of Jesus, God the Holy Spirit is in you, and you've been gifted to serve him as well. Every one of us is qualified to be able to help the kingdom of God. So you've been given time. You've been given abilities. You've been given influence. Influence. Who are you leading to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Who are you trying to use your influence with to try to say, hey, God can change your life. God can make a difference. Uh, you need to come to church. You need to come be a part. You, you know, what, what are you doing to influence others? And, and don't say, well, it's not like I'm a pastor. Can I just be honest with you? You have more influence with your unchurched friends than I could ever have. You know why? Because they know you and they trust you. If they don't trust you, then you need to repent, okay? Uh, but they know you and they trust you. They don't know me and they think I'm weird. I mean, I am weird, but I mean, they think that I'm just a kind of like, you know, pastors are, are strange objects to people who don't come to church. And, and, uh, and you may laugh at that, and I may laugh at that, but that's reality. I have ruined many a person's golf game when they found out I was a pastor and they were playing with me. It's like if they don't cuss, they can't hit the ball. So uh, it, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, you have influence among the unchurched. Who are you leading to Jesus? And then not only do you have time, abilities, and influence, you have resources. How are you investing those resources? And please realize, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Everything you have comes from God. And by the way, if you identify yourself as a servant of Jesus, then who owns the stuff that you have? Yeah, God owns it. So how are you investing his resources? So if we are using our time and our abilities and our influence and our money only for ourselves, then we are headed for a painful accountability. And if we're using our time and abilities and influence and money to build God's kingdom, it's going to be a time of reward and celebration. That's what Jesus is telling us. You see, we need to understand this from God's perspective, and God's perspective is that faithful equals effective. Faithful equals effective. Faithful means we are productive. Faithful means that we are effective in our life and service of Jesus. Faithful means that you are making a difference for the kingdom of God. Now, this truth is important because many churches and many Christians believe a lie. And I know this lie because I was raised to believe it. The falsehood is this. Well, we're not reaching many people, but we're faithful. We show up, we sing, we pray, we listen, and we just stay faithful. We're not growing, we're not really doing anything, but we're here, we're faithful. I grew up in that. I went to a lot of churches that weren't reaching people, that weren't doing ministry in the community, that weren't making a difference in their community. They just gathered together in small numbers and they had their services and they said, oh, we're not, we're not reaching anybody, but we're faithful. And I went, yeah, we're faithful. Okay, we're faithful. Problem was, they told me to read the Bible. See, we want you to read the Bible. I want you to read and apply God's word because if you do, God will change your life. So I read the Bible and when I read this parable and others like it, I wanted to know how did they come up with their definition of faithful? Because I'm like, did you guys read this? Did, did you notice what happened to the person who maintained what they had? Did, did, you, did, did you, you guys believe this, right? This is the Bible and, and all. Look, the servant who maintained was condemned. He was not called faithful. He was called wicked and lazy. The servants who were effective were rewarded for being what? Faithful. Faithful. See, this is good news and potential good and bad news. 
See, if you're a servant of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, who died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, you're going to heaven when you die. Okay? By the way, that's good news. You guys should actually, like, rejoice in that. Okay, the, the message of grace is that no matter how much you screw up in this life, if you're a servant of Jesus, you're still gonna get eternal life at the end of this. That's good news, okay? So stop worrying. I'm not gonna make it. Uh, look, if you're worried about that, we'll talk later. But anyway, the, but here's the thing. You're gonna go to heaven, so that's the good news. But here's the, here's the potential good news, bad news. We're all going to give an account of how we're using the gifts that God has entrusted to us. Every single one of his servants is going to give an account of what we're doing with what Jesus has entrusted to us. Your time, your abilities, your influence, your resources. So if you're not ready for the test, change your habits now. See, Jesus told this parable to his, you know, disciples. They're hearing this. He's entrusting the kingdom to them. He's going to leave in a little while and leave it all in their hands. And he's basically saying, guys, I'm giving this to you. Don't blow it. But if you're not ready for that accountability, then you've got time to change, beginning right now, this moment. So start serving. Stop making excuses about why you can't. Give generously. Trust Jesus when he says, hey, give and it will be given to you. Go to celebrate recovery. Yeah. See, Monday night, 6.30, this room, you know that you need it. You've been talking to yourself about it for weeks, months, years, coming up with excuses. Just get rid of the excuses and go. Look, invite your friends to come to church with you. Even the ones that go, you're a Christian? Yeah, still, you can bring them. Look, Repent and actually start reading your Bible. Don't just talk about reading your Bible. Do it. Make it a priority, not just something you hope you remember to do. Join a life group. Take Alpha. It'll answer a lot of your questions, by the way. But just change your approach to following Jesus. Look, the test is coming, so change your study habits or you're going to fail. And, and I don't know about you, but my goal at the end is to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. But I've also been called to be a pastor, which means not only do I want to hear that, I want you to hear that. I want you to stand before Jesus one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with little. I'm going to put you in charge of much. That's why we're talking about this text. That's why we're preaching this, because I want you to know that there's inescapable accountability for the servants of God. And there's accountability for rejecting the king. I don't, I don't know if you caught this or not, but in verse 14, as the king is going away, it says, his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And then at the end it said, verse 27, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. In the story, the people expressed their preferences for a king. We don't want this man to reign over us. We don't want this man to reign over us. Who are they talking about? Jesus is specifically addressing the religious leaders of Israel. The people appointed by God to represent God to the people. God is standing in their midst. And what do they say? We don't want this man to reign over us. When he was crucified, Pilate put a sign above the cross that said, here is the king of the Jews. And you know what they said? Take it down. He's not our king. You know when Pilate said, you would have me crucify your king? You know what they said? We have no king but Caesar. They committed blasphemy in order to get Jesus crucified, trying to hold Pilate accountable so that they, you know, politically they were going to threaten him to tell on him to Caesar. They rejected the king. We don't want this man to reign over us. And you know what's crazy? They refused to acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, even though they heard about the miracles, probably saw some of them take place. But they knew there were witnesses for 
hundreds of miracles. They, they heard the teachings. In fact, they tried to trap him in his teachings and he outwitted them every single time. They saw the crowds rallying around him, praising him and calling him Messiah. And in the end, they knew that he was raised from the dead. And they still said, we don't want this man to reign over us. They rejected the king. They didn't want to submit. And the judgment is harsh. Can I just tell you that even people who attend church but refuse to embrace Jesus as Lord, surrender to him, submit to him, uh, people who won't want to question the Bible, or go, oh, you're quoting the scripture, I don't believe in that. They you want to compromise on, can't we just be more like the people of the world and, and everything? Look, if you don't want to submit, then judgment is harsh. Can I just tell you that? Because the story makes it unavoidably clear Refusal to submit to God's authority leads to death and hell. I mean, the last verse in this parable is, is harsh. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. There's judgment. The rebellious citizens in the parable were killed. And, and, and by the way, in case you're wondering how this plays out in our lives, today we reap what we sow. Just, you're going to reap what you sow. Whatever it is that you sow, you're going to reap that. that. That's why, you know, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Yeah, you reap what you sow. He said, give, and it will be given to you, for the measure you use will be measured back to you. You reap what you sow. He said, judge not, or you'll be judged in the same manner. So you reap what you sow. In fact, the Apostle Paul just finally said it that way in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Seven and eight, he said, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked for whatever a man sows. That will he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, from the flesh, he will reap destruction. But if he sows to the spirit, from the spirit, he will reap eternal life. In Romans eight, he put it this way, for the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. You're gonna reap what you sow in this life. If you sow to please Jesus, your life is going to be filled with blessings. And if you sow to please yourself, you're going to invite pain and sorrow and suffering into your life. Because refusal to submit to God's authority leads to death and hell. And ultimately, if someone doesn't confess Jesus as Lord, well, in Revelation 20, verse 15, the final judgment says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, death and hell are the future for everyone who rejects the authority of Jesus. I know it's harsh, but the truth is death and hell are the future for everyone who rejects the authority of Jesus. But my neighbors are nice. Can I just tell you, this is why our mission is so important to us at Calvary. To lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus so that they can have eternal life, so that they can experience hope, because Jesus is the only hope for salvation, the only hope for forgiveness, the only hope for eternal life. And, and it, by the way, if you've not yet surrendered to Jesus, can we just invite you to do that? Today, all you have to say is, Jesus, I need you to save me. You're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, I surrender. The Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We want you to be saved. We want you to have eternal life. We want you to be a servant of the king. Yes, there's accountability, but there's life in that. And if you haven't yet committed your life to Jesus, can we invite you to do that? Just pray where you are, but if you want to talk to someone, please find one of the pastors after the service. We're going to be out in the, the lobbies. The prayer team is going to be right here across the front. They would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you're not bold enough to do either of those, at least grab one of those Connect cards, fill it out, and drop it in an offering box saying, I want to talk to someone about following Jesus. Because we want to see your life changed by Christ. You see, I want everyone to find Jesus because when you find Jesus, you find life. So I, look, my choice is I surrender to Jesus. I choose to serve him with my time, my abilities, my influence, and my resources. What are you choosing to do? Because accountability 
is inescapable. Let's pray. Father, thanks for grace. We need it. You know our lives. They are laid bare before you. You see how we spend our time. God, you know how we use our abilities. You are the one who understands the influence we have. And God, you know every penny that we spend. And as your servants, we want, we want to hear well done. So God, right now, speak to us. We invite the Holy Spirit to convict us so that we can be obedient, so that we can change. We invite your power to move through here as we proclaim Jesus as Lord of every part of our life. And Father, for those that are here or tuned in or listening that don't know you as Savior, I pray that today would be the time that they choose to say yes to Jesus. God, we love you. Thank you for loving us first, and thank you for giving us life through your Son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.